Today on this episode of Recorded History, we're going to talk about a song from our Nomads album called Lonely One Kenobi. Uh, Nomads came out in 2012. It's been, well, it came out in 2012 on Ripple, then it's had three additional issues on other labels over the years. Uh, there was Stickman, South Spit, and my own label, Music Abuse. So it seems to be a pretty regular seller in the catalog. And it also contains what might be our most popular tune, uh, Lonely One Kenobi. The origins of the song come from a demo from 2008 that we, that we had done. And right after that demo was started, that it wasn't, the song wasn't completed yet, but the demo was kind of recorded, but not, not, totally realized we took a hiatus from 2008 to late 2011 uh and i did a band called stone axe at that time but when we got back together uh this was the first thing we picked up when we were working on material for what would be the next moss generator album it's a pretty basic rock heavy rock song you know if you we like to call ourselves heavy rock you know if you're going to categorize moss generator and uh, this is a really typical heavy rock tune from in our the way we play it. There's some interesting stuff in the uh, bridge section that I'll that I'll solo up. I do have the the multi tracks today, so uh, I mean it just opens with this you know this fun fun to play guitar riff and uh, yeah. And then it goes into a, it doubles with a lower, there's like a lower. The drums were recorded for, the, we. this was, was recorded here at Heavy Head and it was the first full record that we'd done in this studio, which is at my house. And it was the first record that was done solely on the computer for Moss Generator. Um, and it was, it was done all the drum tracks at once. Many of our albums are recorded over different sessions and different drum kits and stuff like that. But this was a focused record. And, and sometimes when I look back on it, maybe a little too focused. But the drum sounds are real basic kick, snare, snare bottom, rack floor. And, and two overheads, no mics on the ride or the hi-hats. Um, and I don't know why I didn't do that, but. Uh, pretty basic drum sound, real nice. I did do something weird with the drum tracks where later, since I didn't have any ambience, we were all playing in the same room, in this little drum room. And, and even though our stuff was isolated, we weren't able to use any ambience mics outside of the room. Sometimes I'll put stuff down the hall and stuff. So I played the drum thra tracks through a PA and then put mics, microphones down at the end of the, where I would usually put them if we were tracking live drums ambient wise. And we kind of, it, it came up with this. Just to try to fill in some, some ambient feel. Um, bass, you know, the bass is pretty, I think it, we did it with a couple with a sun a sun head and one of those weird rolling bass cubes. And then there's a DI. So I mixed all three of those together. Like and so Scooter's playing that bass line that I play the low guitar on. So yeah. And then we kind of move through the verse, chorus, verse, chorus. Uh, and then there's this, this bridge, double time bridge. There's not a lot of uh, harmonies or anything. Like A lot of this album is very 
direct. Uh, so I didn't want to, I wanted to make it a very simplistic album. So it was, it was able, we were able to play all of it live. And then we get into this breakdown section here. Um, <laughs> So I'll play. Let's see here. That plays out through the solo right there. So, and that, so really, that's the only section that has any real interesting overdubs. And for someone who likes to do that kind of stuff, it's really hard for me to not add things like that into songs. I like to layer interesting bits. Uh, and of course, li live, I try to have to make up for some of that stuff on the guitar. But live's a different beast. So, you know, we always looked at, that, looked at it like that, too, no matter what we did. In the studio, we knew that it was going to have a different energy when we got to the stage. And, uh, another Phase 90 solo. I was kind of always into those. There's that section right there, that brown, brown, brown. That sounds like, to me, every time, I almost think about this every time we play this song. When I get to that section, I think of Mick Ronson. Um, the brown, brown, brown. That's the, he, he did some a lot of stuff like that on like Man Who Sold the World album. There's those kind of pull-offs that are low like that. Um, I guess I should talk about if I can find any influences, and, and I can't with this song. I can't find any direct influences on what where the riff came from or the arrangement. Um, it doesn't seem, it seems to just sit in a Moss Generator, as a Moss Generator song, almost solely. Um, I believe if I was to check the lyrics, there's... Um, destitute and losing that's so a lot of times i'll rip other lyrics destitute and losing is grand funk uh st so little things will come out of my lyrics i have a tendency to to use joni mitchell lines quite a lot for song titles and lyrics she, she's one of my favorite lyricists i don't find any of her her influence in this but especially on the albums after this, there's a, a lot of Joni Mitchell things, and I think it was her transparency as a writer, how she could how she could talk about herself in in not always flattering ways. Um, it was a allowed you know allowed me to to take those chances as well. Once I really got into her lyrics, I thought I would get this one out of the way because I feel like I want to I want to do a lot of songs that are deep cuts or songs that are kind of have a special meaning for me in the production or in the arrangement so even though I, I really enjoy playing this one it's not one of the most exciting productions but it's it's direct uh, uh, approach is probably what draws a lot of people into it it's it, it comes right out of the gate quick and gets into the into the riffs so yeah that's the episode cheers see you next time <laughs>